My goal today is to help you navigate through some important but not so obvious antenna specification sheets. My name is Keith McKechnie and I'll be presenting today. I've been hanging around antennas most of my life. I'm with USAT Corp and we are the US distributor for pointing antennas. Why pointing? Because they are simply best in class and I believe you'll agree with me by the end of this presentation. The author of most of this content is Dr. Andre Ferry, the chairman of Pointing Antennas. Listed here are some topics I'd like to touch on to help you achieve a better understanding. The questions we get many times are, why should I pay for a reputable while designing antenna? And why do I need to pay close attention to how well an antenna is designed? The answers lie in understanding the properties of an antenna well beyond the individual spec sheets. Uh, there are a lot of details involved in antennas beyond what you typically see on a spec sheet. We need to really inspect those spec sheets and watch out for misleading and sometimes false claims. Getting right to the meat of it, this drawing with the ongoing evolution of LTE is one of the most important parts to consider for antenna selection. What you see here is a list of the current frequency bands for cellular and Wi-Fi. Cellular started in small bands around 900 megahertz and then expanded to the 1700 to 2100 megahertz bands. When LTE came to fruition, it was in the lower frequencies and now in our, the recent uh, couple of years, we have LTE bands all over the spectrum. Even repurposing the 1700 to 2100 megahertz range to several different LTE bands. This is the current landscape for LTE frequencies used in the United States. LTE bands started in the 700 megahertz area and, as I mentioned, have now popped up all over the place. Because of this, it is imperative that you have an antenna system that performs well on all frequencies. Many early antennas sold only performed in the 700 to 900 megahertz range, and then they severely dropped off at those higher frequencies shown here. Why were they even sold? Well, because they were easy to design and cheap to make. Uh, but now you may have perhaps have to have them replaced in order for your application to even work. It's important to note that with the latest cellular devices, you cannot control what LTE band they operate on with your carrier. Uh, the carriers will no longer certify any manufacturer's device that has such a control. Uh, they want to be able to shift you to whatever LTE band they deem necessary so they can load balance the traffic on their backend systems. Because of this, it's necessary to have an antenna system that performs well and equally well on each of these LTE frequency bands in order for your application to function as you expect it to. Um, this made antenna design very challenging and pointing started tackling this challenge early on with many talented engineers and PhD level scientists who secured many global patents on their work. So let's look at the main types of antennas that you have. The first type is commonly called a Yagi. It has high gain and is directional, but typically only covers one to two frequency bands with reasonable gain. The next one is an LPDA, Log Periodic Dipole Array. Some people mistake this for a Yagi, which it is not. It has long elements on one side and shorter ones in the front with a feed line linking them. Although big, it's an excellent antenna, giving you high gain over the bandwidth. The Omni is listed next and the most challenging one to get good gain over a wide frequency range, as well as true omnidirectional coverage. Very few companies have succeeded with this and pointing is one of them with the best results. The next one listed is a panel antenna. These are typically directional. The gain is somewhat proportional to the size of the antenna. Several companies have allegedly overrated the performance of their panel antennas, so it's important to understand some fundamental properties of this type of antenna when interpreting spec sheets. For small antennas, there's this puck size antenna. It has low gain, but it is in a small enclosure and has reasonable wide band coverage in all directions. Because of their small size, it is only recommended to use this size of antenna when you're in an urban area and low profile is an absolute must for your application. MIMO, it's a multiple in, multiple out style antenna system that uses two or more antennas to effectively double your data rate if you are able to decorrelate the antennas. Currently in cellular, only 2x2 MIMO antennas are used 
but this will increase to 4x4 as newer LT technology rolls out. Helical antennas are typically used for Wi-Fi applications in mines and tunnels. They are directional and have good propagation, but they are very narrow band. Uh, parab parabolic antennas are typically used for satellite and point-to-point -point backhaul communication only. Now some cool visuals. What we are seeing here is a 3D simulated radiation pattern of a directional antenna. The antenna itself is located in the center where the X, Y, and Z lines all meet. It shows the relative gain in all directions and the dark red represents the highest gain and is a direction where the antenna is physically pointing. Typically on some spec sheets you only see two slices of this 3D pattern. The azimuth is the top view and shows the relative gain as if you were looking down onto the top of the antenna. The elevation is the side view gain pattern and it's as if you were looking at it on its side. Looking now at both the top and side views, the next parameter I want to talk about is the beam width. The center of the beam is defined where the power of the signal is at its peak. In the RF world, for every 3 dB of drop, you are losing half the power. To get the beam width specification, you measure the angle off each side of the center where the gain drops off 3 dB. The total is the actual beam width. Notice the beam width is a complete arc. It's not the plus and minus beam width. Also notice that the gain is not maintained evenly over the, that beam width path. On this slide, we're going to look at how the design beam width influences the gain. There's a lot of math and fundamental equations as to how beam width and gain relate to each other. So looking at the Omni antenna, uh, what you want is that it radiates equally in all directions. Looking at the top view in general, they all do. There are three different Omni antennas with the top view of increasing gain patterns that are shown here. Now looking at the side view of those same antennas, you'll see how this gain increase happens and what you're giving up in exchange for that gain. The side view of the radiation pattern shows a marked difference in the antennas with different gain specs. In order to get the highest gain from an Omni, the radiation pattern is focused narrowly in the horizontal direction, as you can see there. Not so good if you're located in a valley or in a hill, but great if the terrain is somewhat flat. The medium gain and lower end gain antennas have a pattern that is better if the cell towers are located specifically upward or downward in elevation from your site. For directional antennas on the right, as the design of the antenna produces higher and higher gains, you are focusing the radiation from both the top and the side uh, to produce the, the maximum results. So the downside of this is that for very high gain directional antennas, you need to take more time to dial in the physical position of the antenna to the cell tower for maximum results. However, when you do, you'll achieve results that are not possible any other way. Another downside is that you may become more dependent on your connection to just that one cell tower. If that tower goes down, the gain pattern may not be great to where the signals of the backup tower are coming from, if it's off, off to the one side or in the back of the antenna. Applications uh, where a low gain directional would be good is a Wi-Fi hotspot, like in the corner of a warehouse where it would have a great gain in a 90 degree angle. Up to this point, what we talked about were static radiation patterns. What is also in play is that radiation patterns change with frequencies as well. This is where a lot of antenna manufacturers play a lot of games in specmanship. Uh, they often will quote the highest peak gain regardless of the frequency at which it occurs. And many times this point may even lay outside of any cellular band a good vendor should fully expose their gain specs over the full frequency range that the antennas could be used in. 
In addition to gain, the actual radiation pattern of the antenna changes dependent upon the frequency. In the case of an omni, it's not always a ball shape as you see here uh, that shrinks and expands with different frequencies. And you'll see visuals of that coming up. In this example, uh, for instance, at the chart there at the upper right, uh, the gain at 2100 megahertz is 7 dBi and at 2400 megahertz it is 13 dBi. That's a big delta in such a short distance of frequency span and if the system were supposed to operate over those frequencies you may have an issue in an edge coverage situation. This confuses people to no end many times. This next drawing gives you an example of what we often see. Here you see an example of an antenna that is designed to cover 700 to 900 megahertz bands as well as 1700 to 2200 megahertz. And you see that the antenna on the right can have a very low gain around the 1700 megahertz area in the middle there and peak to 8 dBi around 2200 megahertz and then goes low again after that. A manufacturer or a reseller could legitimately claim this is an 8 dBi antenna. At the lower 700 to 900 megahertz bands, the same large variations could be happening. Lo and behold, you may even find that the out-of-band gain uh, is even higher yet, at 12 dBi in this example. So technically, they could even list 12 dBi as the peak gain for this antenna. But clearly, that would be absolutely useless in the actual real-world real world application and deceiving to the user who wants to know how the antenna will perform in his application. The diagram on the left is an ideal antenna spec and would also be listed with the 8 dBi gain. However, you can see that this one would be tons better and more reliable for most applications as it shows consistent gain in the full operational frequency spectrum. The problem is that many people will only do a few measurements and have said that another antenna is the same or better than Poindex antenna. Uh, that other antenna usually is poorly designed, uh, but it's mass produced at a low cost. And it could show the same results if you're just looking at the single frequency where the gain is 8 dBi or higher. But because the frequencies are different across countries, across network carriers, and now even the same network carrier is switching you to different frequency bands on the fly. The customer will experience different, different performance from one antenna to the next. And many times there, it may slow down or stop working altogether. So this specification, which shows gain over the usable frequency range, is very key and should be studied closely. Up to now, we talked about the variations of the pattern and the gain with direction. And we talked about the variation of gain with frequency. We've also had the problem of variation of the pattern over frequency. Uh, on the uh, top left side, we have an ideal patterns of directional antennas and hopefully the pattern will remain consistent over frequency. On the right side, we have a poorly designed antenna where at some key frequencies it has a null in gain at specific directions from the antenna, yet a uh, higher gain off to the side. Surprisingly, it could be technically okay to quote that antenna with a peak gain at one of those side lobes, which would give the false impression that the gain is good in all directions across all frequencies. A nice high gain omni is shown on the lower left you uh, would want it to radiate well uh, on the horizon. A lower gain omni is shown in the middle where it radiates well in all directions, including elevated ones. And quite often you may find an antenna that performs as shown on the, the lower right, which is a disaster of an antenna. It is failing in terms of both its omnidirectionality and elevation pattern. Uh, the interesting thing is that technically one could quote a higher gain with the disaster on the right than the ideal one in the middle. This is simply because uh, one of those lobes or isotropes uh, as known are peaking out in a specific direction, uh, maybe even up to the sky at a high level. 
in, in terms of gain, but in, in directions uh, that's necessary, it would be a much lower gain. So physics would dictate that if I wanted to radiate in all directions, that the middle one would have a to have to quote a lower gain than the one on the right because of all those hot spots and obscure directions that are impractical. And on top of that, uh, those hot spots vary with frequency as well. This is a picture of the same scenario, but showing it in a real live application. The top example shows that nasty design, which even changes with frequency. And so depending on where the police vehicle is facing with respect to the cell towers, you may have adequate radiation and sometimes you may not. Even worse yet, the elevation radiation, you may have most of it going upwards and have low gain towards the horizon where most cell towers are located. But people will quote you their gain at those sky pointed lobes, but they are useless because practically you need the gain to be on a horizon where the cell towers are located. The bottom example is the ideal case as it is omnidirectional on all sides and where the maximum gain pattern is towards the horizon, not towards the planets up in the sky. In review, we covered the most important parts, which are gain varies with frequency. The radiation pattern varies with frequency and that gain can be defined in this foggy fashion where people can print almost anything they want to on a spec sheet. That's based on a peak number that may only be seen at some irrelevant angle or a single frequency that may or may not be of interest. Let's take another step now and look at polarization. Polarization has to do with the direction which with the E field vector varies. The radio waves are actually electromagnetic waves and has an electric field and a magnetic field associated with them. It's defined as the direction of the magnetic field. It's normally in a direction of the longest part of the antenna there shown in the middle and is usually vertical or horizontal, vertical in that case. It's also important to note that the polarizations of each side of any communication link should match. And this is to maximize transfer of the signal, vertical to vertical, horizontal to horizontal. On the left is a circular polarized antenna, which is typically used on the ground and for very good propagation because there is a lot of reflections and tunnels and such. It's good to, it's, it's good if, to if you know the orientation of the receiver. So it gives up some performance in order to, you know, work equally well and with the other end point where polarization is not well defined or could change. Uh, what's most interesting is uh, to use uh, cross polarization to achieve MIMO, multiple in, multiple out. Now for MIMO, uh, this is the most successful way of getting uh, two decorrelated signals. In other words, uh, having two antennas in one enclosure and getting your full two by two doubling of speed is to transmit one data stream horizontal and one data stream vertical or even at a plus or minus 45 degree angles, which are the angles that most US cell tower antennas uh, have uh, in their orientation. This shows an antenna selection chart for omnidirectional antennas. The right side shows the frequency ranges of typical applications. Uh, for each antenna listed on the left, there is a line that you can follow across the chart to see where there is coverage. It is extremely difficult to design an omnidirectional antenna with this kind of wide band coverage with a consistent and contiguous radiation pattern and great gain in all relevant frequencies. And so the talented folks at pointing have achieved just that. Uh, the top section shows low gain uh, omni antennas. The bottom section shows medium gain omnis. With this chart, you could should be able to quickly see that first of all, the antenna you want uh, will cover the frequency bands uh, for your application. After you narrow it down, you can then dig into the detailed specifications. Note though that the gain of each of these antennas will indeed vary across the bands and that is fully disclosed on the spec sheets. 
They are two Omnis on this list we feel are best in class for the U.S. markets, and we carry a lot of stock of them. They are the Omni uh, 292 and the Marine Omni 400, along with uh, several mounting bracket options. This is the same type of chart which shows the directional antennas. The top row shows cross-polarized antennas, which contain two antennas in one enclosure, uh, which are necessary for MIMO and allows for maximum throughput. The LPDA, Log Periodic Dipole Array, is the highest gain antenna, and you would need two of these to achieve MIMO. The three we have volume stock on are the best ones in their class, and they are the LPDA 0092, and the X-Pole 2 for cellular, and the WLAN 61, which is a 4x4 MIMO antenna that's dual band Wi-Fi in a single enclosure. Again, this chart helps you zero in on a specific selection or two, and then you would dive deeper in the actual spec sheets after that. Now let's look at how indoor versus outdoor antenna installations impact the data rate. It's really dramatic, as you can see. The smaller gray represents data throughput of an indoor installation at various distances from the cell tower. The moment you connect to an antenna installed outdoors, you have a massive increase in data rate. The main reason why the increase is so big is based on the total signal health, which is not just the RSSI or signal strength. Uh, signal noise ratio plays a large part in it as well. Nowadays, there are advanced modulation techniques uh, which can be used you use a very simplistic scheme when the signal to noise is bad which yields a slower data rate but when the signal health allows the link then uses 16 or even 64 bit QAM which essentially multiplies the number of bits per symbol yielding a much higher data rate so you may have a reasonable RSSI indoors, but if the SINR and the RSRQ are not great, then uh, the link will only use simplistic modulation schemes, which uh, with much lower bits per symbol means a, a slower data rate. So by taking an antenna outdoors, uh, you may get 10 to 20 dB more gain and you may also be further away from the noise sources that are killing your SINR, uh, which causes your uh, link to have negotiated you know, much lower bits per symbol of modulation scheme, which results again in lower data rates. So what values of RSSI, SINR, and RSIQ are good values and what are not so good values? The link at the bottom is uh, to an FAQ on our website and it details uh, much of this information. So what is MIMO? This is of great interest to antenna designers in that the antenna system itself is integral to achieving MIMO and maximizing the data throughput. MIMO started to be utilized in cellular when 4G LTE rolled out and is also used in the latest Wi-Fi standards. If we just look at a simplified 2x2 MIMO, there are two ways you can achieve it. Uh, one, if you have a, a base station that is transmitting uh, from two antennas, and in this example, the boat would also have two antennas. Uh, with this, you attempt to have two decorrelated signal paths from the base station to the boat, which is possible because the two are far apart, and the signals could bounce off objects and arrive at different times uh, to each of the antennas. Uh, the more decorrelation de uh, there is, uh, the better. Another way to achieve MIMO with great results is to use two antennas that are cross-polarized. In this way, you have a much higher chance of doubling the data rate when each separate data stream is lined up or polarized with the base antenna and the device on the other end. By having your antennas cross-polarized, you can achieve MIMO regardless of any decolorization from reflections which you have to rely on when you are using two spaced apart antennas with the same polarization. This slide shows some topics as to why you want to make sure you buy from a reputable supplier. This is crucial. If you look at environmental considerations, wind um, antennas are typically rated at <clears throat> 160 kilometers per hour 
Uh, in the case of pointing, they actually test all their antennas at the spec and make uh, adjustments to the design if necessary. It's difficult to get into a wind tunnel testing uh, with pointing where they're located, so uh, uh, they actually drive a vehicle at 99 miles per hour with an antenna mounted on it. <laughs> uh, so they don't just throw that number on their spec sheets uh, because it's a typical number that the industry uh, uses. Um, on a typical antenna out of the box, uh, you won't see any rusted or corroded parts, but a year later you might. Pointing makes sure you won't. Before any product is released for mass production, they test all their antennas and all the components that go into them in a salt spray chamber, which is basically age acceleration. They also test their antennas in a freeze chamber and an oven and cycle multiple times to simulate both low and high temperature extremes. Uh, they also do additional uh, tests uh, simulating rain with a special machine uh, to make sure it performs to specifications in those conditions. Uh, ultraviolet testing. Uh, there is an expensive component that you have to add to plastics to ensure the product is UV protected. You really have to trust your manufacturer that they have added this compound or the, and the proper amount of this compound or the product will become brittle brittle rather and uh, shatter in, in three years time. Uh, pointing is known for using only high quality design and high quality materials. Uh, Rojas compliant. Uh, they test everything everything to make sure that their materials are Rojas compliant and not just say they are. Uh, there are a number of companies that have gotten themselves into non-compliance trouble and so pointing avoids that possibility for them at all costs. All these consideration points listed here are important and you can count on pointing and USAT to deliver. What are the issues in terms of comparing and buying different antennas on price and specification that seems to be the same? The testing complexity for antennas means that the customer or reseller has difficulty in assessing all the things that sit on a specification sheet. And as I explained, a lot of them could be misleading and false. So in a sense, there is a trust that you have to rely on the manufacturer's design and specifications. All of this, especially down the line a year or two, will affect reseller reputation as well. Antenna design also needs to address functional imperatives which users don't even know about. In other words, you may want many of the things that I pointed out in the previous slides to be addressed by the designers. The designers need to understand what and how these antennas are going to be used and have good interactions with customers. As mentioned, environmental testing is difficult and you have to rely on your manufacturer that they have adequate test processes in place that properly confirm all the printed specifications. For the final thought, value proposition. Why should you pay for a better antenna? The antenna is the thing that radiates waves and receives waves for your modem or any type of wireless connection. Now we can make the analogy to an audio system. The speaker in an audio system is not usually the most costly component, but it is the most critical component. If you have a low grade speaker with everything behind it being high end, the entire user experience is still very low. The antenna is not typically the most expensive, but it is the most crucial part in achieving a solid, highly reliable wireless connection. This wireless connection is typically part of a much larger and more costly system. Often the electronics are more expensive, but if the system is key to system infrastructure and revenue flow, then one can see it becomes nonsensical to try to save money on the most crucial part of the system when you weigh it up against the actual cost of the system being unreliable or outright failing. That cost is often extremely high. Bottom line in closing, the pointing antenna user on the left is able to reliably monitor and repair quickly any issues with their systems. Whereas the user on the right saves some money on his antenna, but when they have an issue, they may or may not find out about it until it is too late and have a huge mess in their hands as a result. Thank you very much for your time today. Again, I'm Keith McKechnie with USAT and we are the distributor for pointing antennas in the United States. Uh, please contact us. We're happy to discuss your application to help you get going.